Welcome to Human Design Catalyst number 47. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about global cycles and global cycles is one of my favorite topics. Um, oh, I, I should have found this meme. There's a great meme that Chaitanya FX made. He's the kind of resident human design meme lord of the Facebook groups for human design. And he has a great one, which is uh, his kind of recurring joke is family gatherings and him talking about the coming changes in you know 2027 this whole cross of planning coming to an end and the coming cross of the sleeping phoenix um because you can just sound like a complete crazy person if you start talking about this stuff i mean you know human design is already kind of an outrageous system but then as soon as you start to talk about the global cycles changing it just sounds like the realm of science fiction and yet it's incredibly fascinating and incredibly rich area um, of research. And I just love it. I, I'm so enthralled by the, the notion of the kind of changing cycles. Um, I think this has been part of collective consciousness, at least since the 1960s with the idea of the dawning of the age of Aquarius and all of these kind of uh, metaphors that we use for it. But really, um, what I'm hoping to do today is actually, with, with you all here, to go in and actually try to decode this sort of cryptic puzzle that we're given. Because what we're given in human design, and I'll explain how the cycles are arrived at as well, what we're given is essentially this idea that for any given point in time, there are these, these locks. And that the locks have keys that change depending what era you're in. So we're in the era of the cross of planning. So the gates of the cross of planning are the current keys. And we're entering into the cross of the sleeping phoenix. And so just, just to kind of, this isn't really the part that I'm so excited about. I'm mostly excited about going into the decoding of it. But I, I want everybody to understand how we arrive at the cycles and what they really are. And kind of so we're all in the same boat together. For those who know me, they'll know that I really like, um, you know, teacher and student all being in the same boat. And I mean, we're all students here. You know, I'm not really the teacher. I'm going to be giving a presentation, but it's really as a student that I'm doing this. And we're all students here. And so that's why I would also encourage people to please interrupt at any point, jump in with your ideas. I'll, I'll try to leave gaps, but you can also just jump in uh, as we're going because a lot of the work we're going to be doing. Um, I guess there's going to be three parts to this presentation. The first will just be to explain what the global cycles are, how we arrive at them, you know, how, how we've, how Ra figured out that there are global cycles and how he figured out what they are. The second will be to look at the cross of planning and then we're going to end looking kind of into the future. We're going to end looking at the cross of the sleeping phoenix. And that's going to be highly speculative because of course nobody knows what the future will bring but we can look thematically at what gates are going to be the keys to these locks in the future. So to begin with, um, I'm going to share a graphic here that I, I believe, uh, let's see if I go share. Here we go. So this, what we're looking at here, and sorry, it's so small. Um, it, you know, it, it's okay if you can't really read the, the text because it's so tiny. It's mostly just to show that these are the global cycles as mapped from 16,513 BC up to 3,674 AD. So these are just over time how, how they work. And um, what's, what's interesting, the first thing that jumps out is you're going to have, uh, well, so it's, it's that they're, the cross of the Sphinx and the cross of the Vessel of Love are very, very important. So you'll notice that certain eras are, are ruled by the cross of the Sphinx or the Vessel of Love. Really, they're both very important. Um, they just kind of alternate in primary and secondary importance. But what's interesting about these two crosses, so if we just talk about the cross of the Sphinx, the cross of the Vessel of Love, um, the, the cross of the Vessel of Love is already a really fascinating incarnation cross. So for, first of all, I'll take a step back. For those who don't know what incarnation crosses are, I mean, I, I assume we all know, but this is going to be on YouTube, so maybe there'll be viewers. An incarnation cross is simply four hexagrams in the rave I Ching, which is the kind of mandala that shows the 64 hexagrams around the ecliptic, uh, basically one year 
cycle. And the incarnation crosses are two pairs of crosses that are 180 degrees apart. And they're typically separated um, by 88 degrees because they're generated when we're talking about individuals by the calculation of the personality and the design. Uh, the time of your birth, and then the design, which is 88 degrees of the sun before the time of your birth. This is, this is going to be the most technical part of it, and then we're going to get to the really juicy stuff. So I, I don't want to rush through this, but I'm very excited for part two and three, because that's what I've really been preparing. So this is just kind of the technical side. Now, what's, what's interesting is if you look at the cross of the vessel of love, this is four gates, uh, 46, 25, 10, and 15. And these four gates are the gates that um, are active during the eclipses and the solstices. So if you look at the summer solstice, winter solstice, sorry, not, not eclipses, um, equinoxes, excuse me, I misspoke. If you look at the spring equinox, autumn equinox, you're always going to have one of these gates that's going to be active during, during the equinoctal and solstitial points of the year. So these are very important gates. Now the Sphinx is the same deal, but it's the exact midpoints. And for those who have a background in Wicca or any of these sort of paganistic um, celebrations and so on, there are eight pagan holidays, which are the equinoxes and solstices and the midpoints. So these, the gates of the Sphinx and the gates of the Cross of the Vessel of Love, have been celebrated for millennia. I mean, people have always celebrated at the summer solstice. Humans have always celebrated at the you know, winter solstice, the darkest night of the year before it, comes, before it gets brighter. So these gates are already kind of ingrained in the collective unconscious of humanity in so many different ways. Um, and, and so what's interesting is the, the lock, so these are the lock gates. I'm actually gonna change the graphic really quick just because I think it'll be helpful here. Um, and I, this is the most technical part of it. So, you know, it's, it's gonna get a lot, uh, a lot more fun and a lot more poetic soon. Um, we're, we're gonna get to use our poetic mind, our, our right mind as opposed to our left mind. This is just the kind of technical aspect of it. Uh, okay, one moment, I just have to open this, this graphic on my computer. Here it is. Um, okay. So now I'm going to share with you a graphic that's showing the locks and the keys. Um, where it's not popping up. Okay, I have to click share one more time. So what's what we're going to notice is that um, in this graphic, so the lock, the lock is always going to be um, the gates of it's going to be eight gates. It's always going to be the gates of the vessel of love and the gates of the Sphinx. And already, if we look at these gates, it's so fascinating because they're all in the G center. <laughs> it's, it's the G center gates. I mean, that's already fascinating. <laughs> if, if you study, you know, what it really shows is that this is, in the kind of big picture zooming out, this is about the, the mutative direction of humanity, which is, um, you know, is sort of demarcated by the solstice points and by the equinox points, and then the midpoints between those. So the first, the first four we see here are the vessel of love, 25, 46, 10, and 15. Those are the solstices and equinoxes. Then we see 13, 7, 1, and 2. That's the sphinx, and those are the midpoints between. So what, what's interesting about how we arrive at the the procession or the, the, how we arrive at the, the global cycle is through the procession of the equinoxes. The procession, what, what it really means, um, see, I, I'll just take a step back and we'll just talk a little bit about how astrology works. So in Western astrology, tropical astrology, the signs are not actually, um, the, the signs are 12 equidistant divisions that are aligned to the solstices and the equinoxes. In other words, the signs don't change for Western astrology, for tropical astrology. And human design is the same in that somebody born 2,000 years ago with the sun at the solstice is going to have the same gate activated as now. You know, it's, um, you know, I'm born in gate 46 and I was born on the 
autumn equinox. And if I were born 2000 years ago on the autumn equinox, it would still be gate 46 because this is tropical astrology, which basically means it's a fixed, it's a fixed system that's fixed to the seasons of our planet. It's fixed to our planet's rotation around the sun. Now, Eastern astrology is sidereal. Sidereal astrology actually uses the constellations in the sky. So some of you might have looked into, you know, uh, what's called uh, Geotisha or uh, Geotish, which is Indian astrology, where I'm a Libra in Western astrology, but I'm a Virgo in Indian astrology. Well, this is because they've fixed the signs about 2,000 years ago, give or take, and the, the uh, movement of the so-called fixed stars is not actually fixed. The backdrop of the constellations has rotated because of the procession of the equinoxes, basically has to do with wobble and so on. You can go down a whole uh, you know, Wikipedia uh, rabbit hole if you really want to understand how this all works, which I would suggest. I just, I'm just going to kind of give the overview right now. Um, but essentially, what, what's ha what, what happens is you know, we've now drifted apart by about 23 degrees. So what we actually have is two wheels. We have one wheel that's fixed that never changes, which is the wheel based on our seasons. And we have a second wheel that's fixed to the constellations, which slowly drifts over time. So these two wheels that rotate kind of on top of each other, or ours doesn't, you know, our tropical one doesn't, but the other one does. So what they what human design has done what ra has done with human design is to actually look at a time in history when they were in sync you know and then to notice the drift and to see that actually you know there are times in history when gate 25 as we know it at the solstice point is in alignment with the gate 25 constellation in the background and then there's times when it doesn't when it moves out of sync so our gate 25 now, looking at this graphic, until the changes in 2027, our gate 25, meaning at the moment of, um, let's see, what is gate 25? Gate 25 is the spring equinox. At the moment of the spring equinox, uh, the constellation is gate 37, basically. The backdrop is gate 37. And that's slowly drifting, slowly rotating over hundreds of years. And by the time uh, we get to 2027, we will enter into gate 55 at the spring equinox, at the time of the spring equinox. And at the time of the autumn equinox, it'll be changing from gate 40 to gate 59. And the same with the summer and winter solstice, we'll be changing from gates nine and 16 to 34 and 20. So this is just technically how we arrive at it. And, and the other interesting side note here, I mean, it, it is important, I guess it's not really an aside, is just that when we usually talk about incarnation crosses in human design, we talk about them in terms of profile. You could be a 1-3 on this cross, or a 1-4, or a 2-4, or a 2-5. But, but these incarnation crosses are all, the gates are 90 degrees apart. They're not 88 degrees. Therefore, they're all the same line. So, and the other, so there's two points. One is they're all the same line. All the gates are the same line. For instance, right now, as of this, you know, recording in 2020, we are in line one of gate 37, line one of gate 40, line one of gate nine, line one of gate 16, and so on. 61-1, 62-1, 32-1, 42-1. The second point is that this is a precession, not a procession. So because it's a precession, the lines count down. They go from the sixth line down to the first line. So when this changes, February 15th, 2027, we're moving from the first line of gate 37 into the sixth line of gate 55. We're moving from the first line of gate 40 into the sixth line of gate 59, and so on. We're moving into eight sixth lines. And this will be important as we go on and as we kind of deconstruct these. Um, but I just kind of wanted to get the idea across that the lock never changes when you're seeing, and I can share these, these graphics afterwards, by the way, with people who want them, um, just message me and I can send these to you. But the lock gates never change. For every era, the lock gates are the vessel and the sphinx. But for our era that we've all been born into, uh, the keys have been the gates of the cross of planning, which are on the solstices and equinoxes, and then the gates, um, of the cross of Maya, which have been the midpoints. 61, 62, 32, and 42, that's the cross of Maya. 
And we're moving into the cost of the sleeping phoenix and the cost of penetration. So I'm going to share a different graphic now. Um, one moment here. Okay, so this was the really technical kind of part of it. And now we're going to get to the fun stuff. And here's where I'm going to be turning to all of you as well um, to hopefully use your poetic mind to um, help come up with some poetic deconstruction of these keynotes. Now, this is a lot of information to take in all at once. It does look very intimidating to see. I, I, I presume everyone can see this graphic right now where it says the nature, the example, the temple, the leader, the pattern, the plan, the way, and the witness. And this is a lot to take in. And you know, I've, I've been working on global cycles for a few months now. And in the past couple of weeks, I've been digging really deep into um, this aspect of it, of locks and keys, because this is kind of, um, the, the study of locks and keys is how everything else you might've heard about the changing cycles comes into being. That's how we've come to understand all these things. So when you hear about the movement into the cross of the sleeping phoenix and how the world is gonna change and the breakdown of institutions and all that stuff, it's all in here, really. It's in here, but it needs to be decoded. And it's not easy. Um, but it's a lot of fun. So, so what we're going to do just for a kind of program here, we're, so this is the time we've been in. This is until February 15th, 2027. And, I, and this is going to be, um, you'll notice that the outer gates, the ones that are labeled, the witness, the nature, the example, and so on, these are the lock gates. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be First, we're, we'll just go through each one of these, each one of these eight locks, and kind of talk about how these are perennial themes. The lock keys never change era to era. As long as there's been humanity, these lock gates have been the same. In other words, every era of humanity, there is a nature, there is a way of being. Every era of humanity, there's an example, someone that you, you, you know, look up to, or the example that is meant to be followed. There's a temple, which is a place of worship or a place where you, you really get, get to enjoy the spirit and so on. Um, there's been a leader, you know, a way of, of you know, leadership, a theme of leadership. There's been a pattern for each era. There's been a plan, which is kind of a direction. Um, and there's been the you know, way, which is the kind of way of being. These are very mystical keynotes. And finally, there is a witness, which is what that era is there to witness. And these are very mystical keynotes. They're very poetic and deep keynotes. And, you know, I, I'm not going to do them so much justice, I, I really think, to understand. I mean, we, we, we can have our own interpretations of what these keynotes mean. Some of them are easier than others. Um, but th that's going to be part of the fun is kind of synthesizing these keynotes together to talk about what does it mean for the cross of planning for the way to be in gate 37. What does it mean in the cross of planning for the nature to be in gate nine and so on? And that's what we're, we're gonna do as, as we go through this. Um, because I, I, really, I really think this is, where, this is where the really juicy stuff happens. And there's gonna be really two, two things that we're looking at here. So firstly, we're gonna be looking at, at this graphic and then I'm gonna show the same graphic but with the gates of the cross of the sleeping phoenix and the cross of penetration. And that's kind of a glimpse into the future. So just to give an example, just to kind of get the, the juices flowing, to get the kind of poetic mind, mind going, let's just start with gate 25, because that's one I kind of used. So gate 25, gate 25 is the way. Um, I mean, my basic note for it, my fundamental note was that since 1615, the way has been gate 37. Well, gate 37 is the family. So simple enough, the way has been the family. Since 1615, the family has become, has been such an important um, aspect of what it is to be human. It's simply been, this is, this is the way forward. Everything is about the family. Do it for your family, do it for your kids, put your kids through college so their kids can go to college, you know, um, that tribalism. Also, because we have definition in the cross of planning, anytime there's definition, the definition tends to dominate the theme. We have both gate 37 and gate 40. 
So that creates the channel of community. So you could say not only is the way the about family, but it's also about community. And this is something to realize that, you know, we don't really know what life was like before 1615, but we can guess. We can guess that before 1615, um, it, there was not as much given to the community. You know, Ra's joke was that if he was born before the cross of planning, if he were a, from the age of Pisces, if he were a Piscean black magician instead of a, an Aquarian black magician, he would have just kept human design for himself. He wouldn't have given it to the community. He wouldn't have tried to give it to others to help them. Why would he give back? Why would he, you know, why, why would he make a bargain with them? He would just use it for his own gain. And what we kind of take for granted is that probably, we don't really know, but probably before 1615, there was not this sense of community. There was probably just, you know, people out for themselves, or if they got some information or knowledge, not necessarily giving it back to the community. Obviously, we've had deep tribalism for so long, but it's, it's a little different now. And I, I have a few further notes. We can kind of dig deeper into it. So the other thing, so the, the other thing that was, so I was kind of trying to deconstruct this and dig a little deeper. I was like, okay, so the way is a universal, it's a, it's a universal love gate. It's, the, it's universal love, 25. So universal love really has to do with the theme of universalization. So the question is, what is universalized in a given era? What's been universalized in our era is the family, the global community, the global village, like Marshall McLuhan talked about, or you know, the internet, or all of these things. And what, and what else is funny is because we started in the sixth line back in 1615, we've only since 1961 actually gotten to the first line. And so now as we've come into the first line of 37, you can get even more specific in what is being, being I, mean, I mean, so okay, there's two things. One is now we've really seen it come fully into its own because it does take a long time for these things to emerge as we've kind of gone, oh, excuse me. Um, sorry, I'm getting a, oh, that's somebody that's supposed to be in the meeting. I bet maybe he's having a hard time joining in Zoom now. Okay, um, in any case, um, so we've we've really seen it's been until 1960 or 61 that it's actually taken it's actually taken a really long time to build that global community. There wasn't really a global community in the 1600s. You know, it's taken a long time to emerge as a theme. Um, but also, we can look at the 37-1 since the 19 the early 1960s. And my notes here were that 37-1 uh, has to do with inherent respect. Basically, the desire uh, the tr for tribal groups to get respect, and it's it's the line of tribal sensitivities. So a couple ideas here. One is that we've entered into the foundation of tribalism. So in a weird way, even though we're so advanced and futuristic in so many ways, there's more factions than ever before <laughs> because we've gone to this foundation of tribalism. But the other is, at least in the detriment, is oversensitivity oversensitivity, hypersensitivity emerged in 1961 and is culminating as we approach 2027. Tribal groups that are offended that they haven't gotten the respect they think they deserve. But there's positive sides as well. There's positive sides of it. Um, one of the positive sides is that there's been this, this also, this kind of universal, this, sorry, this, um, you know, because it's, it's mixed, it's a mixed tribal and a collective theme, there's an impersonal aspect of it as well, where it used to be that tribalism was linked to bloodline, was linked to um, your actual family. And since the early 60s, it's actually been this idea of choosing your own family, communes, intentional living. I mean, even something like, you know, human design has a sort of distributed global community of chosen family which is another interesting aspect of that. So there's a, you know, good and a bad, but, but I just, you know, as soon as I read the, that, you know, 37.1 and I read its detriment of oversensitivity and hypersensitivity, and I'm not somebody who thinks that this is, that all um, complaints of being disrespected are oversensitive. There's a lot of really valid ones as well. I mean, there's been an incredible emergence of human rights and so on um, during this era. So it's not just oversensitivity, but, 
that is one part of it. It is the demanding of respect, the demanding of equal rights and so on, and also the detriment of oversensitivity. And if anyone has, so this is where I'm asking for anyone who has any associations, like if you have gate 37 or if you have gate 25 and have your own associations, please speak up. The other interesting thing is that if you have any of these gates, um, not that it's necessarily personally relevant to you, like it's not gonna necessarily change your life to know this, but it's just an interesting aside that you are kind of implicated in the global program, that besides just having a personal life program, you know, if you have gate 37, you're kind of implicated in the global program. The other interesting thing would be to look at what line you have in that gate. For instance, people who have gate 37 line one are going to be very relevant to the current thinking about family and the current understanding of family. But if you have line two, it's a very old fashioned pre-1960s family values. And if you have line three, it's like pre-1900s family values. And if you have line four, it's pre-1840s family values. So, so, you know, when you meet people sometimes who are kind of, you know, anachronistic and seem like they're from another era, some of it could be that they actually have lines which were predominant cultural themes at an earlier era. It's just really an interesting, interesting side note there. You know, if you have, you know, 37.2, then you, you might feel okay. Oh, okay. Nice. Years. Excellent. Great. So now I can put this later onto YouTube. All right. Well, thank you all for. Well, we were using our strategy. There. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this. Thanks, Esther, for hosting. So. Yes. I'm just going to go back to sharing the graphic. So yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess this would be. It is kind of an intimidating graphic to look at, but I think it's helpful. It's helpful just to have yeah. it here, um, just to kind of understand, you know. What, what we're looking at. So for those um, who missed the first part of it because I neglected to allow them in <laughs> to admit them to the meeting, uh, what we kind of went over was how this is generated. Basically the outer numbers where you see it says 10, 1, 46, 7, and so on, those are the solstice equinox points and the midpoints. And those are um, what we're calling the locks. And basically, they are the perennial locks. They are the locks that never change. Every era has an example. Every era has a plan. Every era has something we're here to witness, Every era, and so on. And what we're looking at right now, due to the procession of the equinoxes, is basically what, what we've been here to witness for the last 400 years, what, we've, what, what has been our nature for the last 400 years, and so on. And this is the, the global conditioning program. So this is, you know, the kind of program of just what the homogenized masses have, have been, basically. Like, what has been the way? What has been the plan? What has been the pattern? And later, we're going to look at the same graphic, but with the gates of the sleeping phoenix. Sorry, sleeping, sleeping phoenix, excuse me. <laughs> Sphinx, Sphinx and Phoenix are similar words in a weird way. We have a lot of the same. Sleeping Sphinx would be an interesting one, but uh, yeah, it's been sleeping for 3,000 years. No, um, so, so we're going to look at that later. But basically where I started was with gate 25, the, the uh, way. And basically since 1615, the way has been the family. And it started in line six, line six of gate 37. And, you know, this is a really deep rabbit hole. I mean, you could read the lines of Gate 37 and look at what era, you know, from 1615 to 1680 or, you know, whatever was the sixth line. And then from 1680 to 1550 or whatever was the, um, you know, and you can keep looking, you can, what was the fifth line and so on. And since 1961, we have been in the first line of Gate 37. And so what I was saying was the first line of Gate 37, um, I'll oftentimes just Google like, you know, 37.1, you know, human design, and I have my notes on it, but I can just read it directly um, from the Ray V. Ching, because the whole thing's online, so it's really, really useful. So line one, the mother slash father, and the blue line is a position of inherent respect that ensures a focus for the development of guidelines. So on the plus side, since 1961, there have been a lot of newfound respect. There have been a lot of new human rights, civil rights movements, gay rights, women's rights, all different rights for different marginalized groups. 
and the exaltation, harmony is the key to the successful maintenance of you know, relationships. So there has been a newfound harmony that we never thought possible. There are, you know, gay kids of born again Christians who are finding harmony with their family and st stuff like that. You know, there actually has been uh, on the on the high side of it. Um, so, and I actually, I guess there is no polarity to this, but when I was hearing Ra talk about it, he did say that there is a sort of other side of it, which is oversensitivity, hypersensitivity, and incredibly sensitive identity groups, tribal groups that are all offended that they're not getting the respect they think they, they deserve. So, you know, already we can see as we're coming to the end of this first line, as we're seven years away from this great turning of the wheel in 2027, that there's already a kind of pushback against this. And uh, there's already a lot of, you know, as much as I detest um, the rise of the alt-right and so on, you can see how at a program level, you know, there's, a re there's this real battle between oversensitivity and people saying, you know, you're all snowflakes and buck up and have thicker skin. On the other hand, there's people saying, no, we, we demand respect. We demand actual respect here. Um, so, in any case, it's been a really interesting thing since the 1960s to see this play out. So that has been then, you know, the way, and we're going to see how different it is. Just as a little hint, we won't talk about it now, but the way is moving into gate 55. So just we'll we'll, we'll talk about that, you know, for the for the second half when we go towards to look at the cross of the sleeping phoenix. But what does it mean for the way of the family to go away? For the way of community to go away? And for the future to be the way of spirit, the way of the individual spirit, to move from a tribal gate to an individual gate, going your own way. I, I don't want to get too far ahead because I think it's important to, to look at the era that we live in, which is really the past as well. We're, we're kind of living in the past right now because we're at the very end of it. You know, there's, there's the weight of the past, which is piled up and is kind of coming to fruition in our time. But yeah, what is what is being you know universalized? Gate twenty five, gate of you know, universal love, the family, the global community, the global village. So my next note is for gate forty six. I, I don't have such long notes for all of these, so I would encourage anyone who has any ideas about these gates, please jump in because some of these are very short notes, which is good because there's a lot of gates to get through. But gate forty six, uh, gate forty six is the the temple. And this one was a little hard for me to, to deconstruct because I thought, what do I know of gate 46? I mean, my personality son is in gate 46. I know that it's the love of the body, the cherishing of the body as the temple. But I had to kind of take it even more metaphorically to just think, where are our temples? What is the temple of this era? Every era has the place of worship. Every era has the temple. Well, it's been in gate 40 the gate of aloneness. So I started to think, what if this past era has actually been so much of the bargain is I'll work for you, I'll work for community, I'll work for tribe, so you just can leave me alone and I can go sit on my couch, sit in my cave, watch my Netflix and just block out the world. And that was a luxury that people before 1615 did not have. They did not have the luxury of aloneness. They did not have the luxury of sleeping in their own aura. They did not have this luxury of having all of this space. Since 1615, I mean, we're all living like emperors and empresses, you know, from an ancient era in terms of how much space we have and how much aloneness we have and how the aloneness is really the temple of the time. It's the place of worship. When you're alone in nature, how many people talk about how amazing they feel being alone in nature, how amazing they feel getting that, to have that aloneness because they've held up their end of the bargain. Remember, gate 37 yeah. 40 is all about the bargain. And part of that bargain, the bargain works both ways. The bargain is I will work nine to five in exchange for my you know, aloneness. It's also gate 40 is a love gate. It's like the mule. It's the, look how hard I work for you and you'll give me that affection, gate, gate 37. Mm -hmm. And so there's been, um, you know, really since 1615, I mean, it, it took hundreds of years to, you know, negotiate that. What, what's been fair has changed over time. And you can see how these cycles take hundreds of years to fully crystallize. The nine to five workday didn't really crystallize until, you know, we got to the second line or the, the first line. Um, 
because in the 1850s, the average life expectancy for an adult male in Manchester was still around 18 years old because they were all working in factories, you know, that the, you know, adults worked 12 hours by day and then the kids came in for the other 12 hours. And this was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution or the 1880s or you know, something like that. You know, it kind of began in the 1820s um, and then, you know, and it's taken a while for, for what's fair to be established. But in any case, Gate 46, the temple has been in, you know, aloneness. And it's moving to 59. And we'll talk about that as well. It's moving into um, a tribal gate of dispersion, of intimacy, of sexuality. I mean, I kind of think that in the future, it might be so rare to have such intimacy because intimacy is not going to come easy in the future, as we'll see as we get into that, that that might become a sort of temple, you know, that the intimate bond between two people may take the place of that special temple that, that we now, the place of worship. Okay, gate 10, um, the nature, as it's called here, it's a gate of behavior. It's... Uh, it's the only gate that really, really wants to be in the world. It's kind of an interesting way of also thinking about it. And this is just something I've heard Ross say about gate 10. It's really excited. It's like, yeah, I'll be in the world. Everyone else is like, why me? Poor me. But gate 10 is like really excited um, to, to be in the world. And it's what keeps us in the world. It's, it's behavior, of course. It's, it's what is the nature of people for a given time? Well, our nature has been focus. Our nature has been gate nine. Our nature has been details, the, the taming power of the small. And taming is an interesting word also because um, taming, you know, this is from the Wilhelm I Ching translation. It really is kind of like uh, manipulation. It means to, to manipulate, not a negative sense, but to be able to, to manipulate the small, to change the small, to use the small to your advantage. And it's, it's the manipulation of energy in detail, which has brought us everything from the atom bomb to microprocessors. I mean, it is, it is the absolute, we are at the foundations of detail and focus in this time. Like we take for granted the insane amount of detail that goes into producing a TV show like Game of Thrones. You know, how many or how many hundreds of people have to work on the CGI for a big budget movie or have to work on a video game or any of these things. Just the incredible, um, you know, it's also, it's also about what we've been told, what is, how are you supposed to behave? Like we tell kids, you know, behave, you're supposed to behave. Well, focus, that's how you're supposed to behave. You're supposed to behave like a student. You're supposed to, you know, everyone's expected in professional circumstances, you're supposed to be focused. You're supposed to focus on what the other person's saying. Don't goof off. Don't do, you know, don't be thinking about something else. So it's really been a sort of, um, yeah, I mean, since 1615, it's been all about the details, all about the focus. And that's how we're being told to, to, you know, behave. We, we could go much deeper into all of these. We have so much ground to cover. I think, I think I'm not going to really go into the lines. I went into the lines of a few of these. Um, yeah, but I think it's interesting if you want to go further into any of these, just look up the first line of, of gate nine and then try to kind of think about how that story has played out in the behavior of the world since 1961. Gate 15, the pattern. So the pattern is, is really integral to life itself. All living things have it. The 515 is this kind of core channel of, of life. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also a love gate. I mean, all four of these are love gates. So I mean, I, I guess we, we you know, could have also talked about how gate 10 is the love of focusing, how much people are love to focus right now. And gate 46, the love of the uh, temple is also a love of being alone, how much people love being alone. Well, gate 15 is saying, um, you know, what, what kind of pattern do we love? We love skills. Mm -hmm. Because you'll see 16, the gate of skills and the channel of talent, you know, we love skills. I mean, I get so excited when I see someone 
on you know you know like YouTube and it's a nine year old singing a Prince song and they have amazing skill or some jazz guitarist who can play Charlie Parker at double speed or you know um, right. we love skills we, and and it's also it's the it's the outcome of the experimental you know logical process that starts in fifty eight and goes goes up that um, circuitry through the 18 and through through the 48, finding its voice in gate 16 in the throat. And it's it's really, it's a love of experimentation. So this is like, especially since we entered into, you know, 1961, that's the experimental generation. I mean, all of us alive today are some of the most experimental people who have lived in 15,000 years or something, because we're all trying out everything, trying out all different alternative lifestyles, trying out all different health regimens, trying all different, systems of understanding. I mean, it, whatever it is, this goes through, this cross cuts through and permeates every aspect of, of human life, this love of experimentation. You know, uh, you know Raj's joke was, um, we're all working harder th than ever now. And even though we have that bargain, we don't have to work till 5 p.m., people are constantly doing that logical work because they're experimenting in every aspect of their life. They go home and experiment with different child rearing techniques. They, you know, go to a you know they're experimenting with nonviolent communication different ways of talking to each other and they're experimenting with different with everything it's all a huge experiment and this drive to experiment is simply not going to be there in the future people aren't going to have time they're going to be too busy you know 3420 is coming in the future that <laughs> you know all about this john <laughs> yeah you know 3420 is a powerhouse of getting stuff done and we're all going to be really, really busy getting a lot of things done in the future. And we're not, not necessarily going to have that time to experiment that we do now. Um, but yeah, the love of experimentation, the love of skills. I mean, it's just taking a step back. You know, part of my enjoyment in studying all this is because it's so easy to take things for granted. It's like the, the fish in the fishbowl. We don't really, we take the water for granted. Well, our water has been skills. We've all been raised in an incredibly, I would go as far as to say, this was my note here. We are the most skilled creatures ever to exist. The most skillful humans are alive today. Like the, the, the most perfected skills. It's just incredible um, what, what you see in, you know, as how skilled we are. And that this is such an integral part of life that you have to be skilled in this life. Since 1615, the skilled are the ones who are going to really make it. And the skilled are so linked to survival and so on. Okay, so now we're leaving uh, the vessel of love. Oh, wait, I had another note. This was just a funny side note. I took some notes from Ra's lectures and, uh, oh yeah, two, two, two more notes on gate 16. One was, he said, so the positive side of this is we have so much experimentation, we're discovering all sorts of medical breakthroughs and we're discovering all these incredible things. The other side of it is B.F. Skinner and Joseph, Joseph Mengele, or the, you know, the kind of Nazi experimenter. I mean, there's a bad side of it too. And for those who don't know B.F. Skinner, you know, Ra kind of glossed over it, but I, I've studied a lot of psychology and B.F. Skinner was a developmental, early behavioral psychologist who experimented on his kids. I mean, he, he loved, first of all, he, he was one of the, the people who used a lot of rats and mazes, but then he also like did the same kind of thing with his kids. Like he would put his kids in boxes and like, he, he was, it was, it was terrible what he did, but this is the kind of dark side of the love of experimentation. He was so excited to see what would happen if he put his kid in a box and, you know, or, you know, Joseph Mengele, oh, we're going to experiment, you know, fantastic. Um, and then my second note here, which is an interesting one because 16 is, is collective, but one of the, one of the aspects of 16 is also identification. And this one, I, I never really understood why. I still don't have a, uh, a great handle on why, but 16 is kind of one of the gates of identifying with things. So for, you know, and whatever reason, um, it's also a time of, uh, yeah, actually, that doesn't make any sense. I wonder if he misspoke. I wonder if he was talking about gate 15, because 15 is in the G center. You know, that, that's an identity gate. Every gate in the G center is an identity gate. Right. Um, this could have actually been an example of Rob misspeaking. He had so many third lines and, you know, sometimes he would say that and I, I wrote it down with like a question mark, like gate 16 identification. What? So I'm just going to, I'm just going to guess he actually meant 15. I did play it back to make sure he does, he does say 16. In any case, um, what it was in the context of talking about the 15 and the 16 together, he just said, you know, this is really the era of the me era. 
and there's a great documentary film, uh, which I can highly recommend, um, called Century of the Self. And for those who haven't seen it, it's, it looks at um, Edward Bernays, who kind of popularized the term uh, propaganda and was a cousin of Sigmund Freud and used Freud's psychoanalytic techniques to essentially develop um, marketing and public relations as we now know it based around identification. The century of the self is the film and it's all about how you know you don't just buy the product for what it does for you, you buy it because it gives you a sense of identity, of me, I. And I think that's another interesting thing is that that will also be going away, that this whole time of the I period, the time, you know, I mean, I, we, people talk about the, you know, 80s as this kind of decade of it's going to be going away. Now, there will be selfishness, you know, line six of gate, gate 59 is called selfishness. So we are going to be moving into a time of selfishness, but it, it won't be identif it won't be about identity. It won't be pride in a certain you know, oh, look, I bought an Apple product. I'm identified with Apple. And, you know, those are PC people. And I think we, we've already kind of seen the breakdown. The cool thing about do, doing this research now, as opposed to 25 years ago, when, when Ra kind of came out with this, is that we've seen, since he, he wrote a lot of this or spoke a lot of it in his lectures, we've already seen a lot of it break down. Already, people kind of have this feeling of, who cares about identity groups? Who cares if you, you know what I mean? Like use a Mac, use a PC, who really cares? And it wasn't really like that 25 years ago. I mean, we're already, we're already on this cusp and we can see we already have one foot in this next era. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the gates of the Sphinx. Before we continue, does anybody have any comments on the love gates? We're about a quarter of the way through. I know this is a lot of information and if people do have to drop out and watch later, that's totally fine because this, this is a lot, but yes, please. Oh, no, I, think you I, do have to, I do have to drop out, but I, I will watch later. And oh, so great to see you face to face. Yes, it's really great Good to be with you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah, so we're about a quarter of the way through. Uh, we're gonna do the four Sphinx gates and then we'll look at um, the cross of the sleeping phoenix and, and we'll do those so but yeah um how is it going so far do people have a good grasp on kind of how we're doing this the the kind of method behind it or the, the technique because that's what i always like to teach i mean these are just my opinions what i really want to show is how do you come up with this yourself so that if you if you want to study it further you can you can look at you know gate two the plan and kind of ask yourself what's the plan right now and then look at gate 42 and put it together and see what the plan has been and how that's going to change um because i really like to just give the formula and and this is the formula and then i'll kind of show how i've done it um but that's just, that's my own my own way of doing it so yeah john i'm just wondering are you going to share the screen on when you yeah. save the um the video is it not sharing? No, Sorry. it is sharing now, but I'm just saying like when you post the uh, YouTube, are you going to share? The yeah, screen? I think it's going to share exactly what you're seeing. Oh, okay, great. Well. So this, this should be up here the whole time, I think. It, it just helps me if just to have this up here too, because it's a lot of gates. I mean, we're talking about, we're looking at 16 different numbers here. So mm -hmm. really a lot of numbers. But um, yeah. As, as we dig in though, it becomes, it becomes more clear. I mean, it was really cool for me because my introduction to global cycles was not through locks and keys. It was simply looking kind of at the holistic um, surface of it. Like, oh, we're leaving the cross of planning, entering the cross of the sleeping Phoenix. Okay, we can kind of think about how the cross of planning is about community and the sleeping Phoenix is about doing your own thing. And, but now that I'm looking at the locks and keys, I see how so much of that, um, was how the people came, came up with that, how Ra himself came up with this. And it, it really makes me appreciate it that much more that he could start with what is basically a cryptic code, you know, and to decode that into something meaningful is just incredible. Um, I, I love it. I really like the, um, when you were talking about the temple mm. with the 40 to the 46, uh, that shift over and and then the other side the way because yeah. i can see that um my sister yeah. has the same channel that you have the 46 29 mm. 
and the love of the body and you know just knowing that aspect that's her temple and she treats it that way mm -hmm. how she eats she gets enough sleep like she's very much about that well and I, then the other uh, side. Yeah, I, 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 I always called it the taurus moon you know taurus ascendant but my whole life i've loved spas i've loved baths yes i also yes. have right variables so that's another part of it but i've loved you know mm -hmm. anything that rejuvenates for gate 46 people yes. i always tell them uh it's really important to continually refresh yourself. Like when you get mm -hmm. home, being out, wash your feet, you know, wash your hands, yes. wash your face. Well, now, of course, even more. Because, but, you know, always, I've been saying, <laughs> just for the refreshing, yeah. kind of, you know, rejuvenating yeah. aspect of day yeah. 46. Yeah. Really, it's important for everyone. But for those who yeah. have day 46, it's essential because we get frazzled. I mean, it's in Libra. Yeah. It's the classic Libra frazzle that people talk mm -hmm. about. Just as a side yeah. note, also, I, I love, um, for those who, are, who know astrology, I love to look at the signs, to, to list what gates are in those signs, and then mm -hmm. to understand how those gates contribute to the reputation those signs have. Yeah. Like gate 46 and being frazzled is kind of a you know Libra quality, and it's because if they're not you know rejuvenating enough, they get really mm -hmm. scattered and frazzled and all over yeah. the place. And um, you know, one of my favorites, just as a side note, is to look at Capricorn. Capricorn is one of the most clear. Um, bridges between conventional Western astrology and human design that I found. Because in Capricorn, you have all these gates that are just like one after the next of what we say Capricorn's about. Gate 54, ambition, gate 10, very well behaved, uh, you know, and you can go on and on and see the different aspects of that. But we'll leave that for maybe a, a future Zoom meeting where we can invite some astrologers and do the, uh, yeah. the bridge. Yeah. The bridge there. It's funny. My sister Kathleen has um, about a thousand dollars worth of gift certificates to the Fountain Spa. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> Hair, nails. She does a lot of the. She well, takes care a, of. We have a spa here in Santa Fe called uh, Ten Thousand yeah. Waves, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh -huh. And um, I'm just in heaven whenever I go there. And I was lucky enough to befriend some of the employees. So I, I now, not now because it's closed, yes. but when it reopens, <laughs> right. I, Future. Those, I, I've been invited to their uh, employee yeah. gatherings, their full moon gatherings. So that's, uh, yeah, so I'm enjoying it. Favorite. Thank you. It's my favorite. Okay, well, let's look at the Sphinx gates. So now we're going to look at the leader, the plan, the witness, and the example. And so the real difference so we've been looking at the cross of the vessel of love that's kind of what what we've loved in a given era you know we've loved our family we've loved our time alone we've loved focusing we've loved skills now we're going to be looking at the direction the way things are headed because the sphinx is all about you know, direction and these are the eight you know g-center gates is about love and you know, direction so it makes sense why we say that the g-center is the center of, of, of that. But the other thing is, um, it's really gate two. I wonder if it's easy for me to find a graphic here. Well, I, I won't bother looking for it now, but um, if you look at the body graph, you'll see that, that gate two, the, the gates of the Sphinx make a kind of Neptunian um, trident. <laughs> you know, it's gate two at the bottom and then it's the three gates above it. And so what's interesting is gate two is actually the gate, which the sun is in gate two right now, interestingly. Mm. That's actually the gate of direction, the direction we're going, of uniform direction, the direction everything is going. And the other gates, 13, seven, and one, are perspectives on that direction. That, that was my note that I wrote here, kind of based on you know, something Ra had said. He had a really poetic, really great kind of myth, you know, mythological way of describing it, saying that we're all on Neptune's trident hurtling through space, you know, or Shiva's trident. He liked to use that as well. Um, but in any case, I think maybe, so we could start with gate two then, the plan, and then we, and then we look at um, the other gates as other things that we're here to see or perspectives on it, on that direction. So what's the plan? <laughs> well, Pretty simple. The plan is gate 42, part of the abstract experiential format channel. Mm -hmm. And it's the part of it that has to do with endings. So what's the plan? The plan is for everything to end. You know, this is why Ross said he was a door closer. It's the plan is to close the door on everything that came before. 
And, and so we've actually had 400 years of door closing. And as we entered into the 1961 era, the past, you know, since then, um, that's, that's been, it's heightened and it's been like the last chance to get it all out. It's the last chance to do everything because there's this pressure here. It's, there's the pressure that we know it's closing. We know it's ending. Something in our DNA knows it. And so that's why there was such a sense of urgency. I mean, the Human Genome Project had so much urgency to map the human genome. By 2011, they had these, these deadlines. And so many different projects have these, this intensity and this, this, urging, this urgency to finish because the uniform direction of everything is towards ending. And uh, so it's the end of things. It's the end of details. This is my note. An end to details, an end to inner truth. Um, an end to research, an end to the vast genetic pool, because we have such a variety of DNA intermixing now. I mean, it's really a lot of endings. This, you know, I had to laugh when I first kind of saw that, because I was like, oh, this is why Ra makes such a big deal about the door closing, the end of mysticism, the end of occult knowledge, the end of all this stuff, is because part of the plan is for it to all end, you know? This, this is the direction, this sort of uniform direction everything is going towards. And then we have these other three gates, which are um, perspectives on that. So the witness, what are we really here to witness? So that's, that's an interesting one, right? Um, gate 13, so gate 13 is, is the experiential, the reason he calls it the witness, so just to kind of take a step back to what I was talking about, with gate two is this, you know, direction we're going. Gate 13 is experiential, it's abstract, it's about the past. It's going to say, the last time I took this road, or the last time I went this direction, that happened. Um, gate seven over on this side is logical. So it's going to say, it's the voice of I think, and it's logical, and it's going to say, based on this pattern, we're going to get to this point, and it's going to try to to logically predict, and this is how you know leadership happens. Um, the channel of the alpha has, has this gate. And then uh, gate one, the example is of course individual, so it just says, I know where I'm going, <laughs> just ignore us every other <laughs> but, but we'll see how, how these three are also key themes for this time. Now, I have to say, of all of the time that we've been in, the thing that makes me the happiest or the most excited is to have lived through the first line of gate 61. It's just incredible. 61 is the gate of mystery. You know, it's this really mysterious individual knowing gate. And the 61 one, the first line of gate 61 is occult knowledge. And it's just incredible that since 1961, right, you know, sometimes Ross says 1960, and I think that's because that's when Pluto transited this line. I think. The first line, it's, this is also very interesting, it's just a side note. Pluto entered into 61.1 around the same time as the global cycles, you know, coincidentally, you know, within one year of the global cycles going into, you know, the, 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 same, the same line. So 61.1 has been like double activated in some sense. It's been activated by Pluto transit and also as part of the background frequency of the global cycles because of the precession of the equinoxes. 61.1 is quite simply the time of the revelation of occult knowledge. And Pluto is its exaltation. Pluto is the best of the best expression that we ever will ever get of this. And Pluto is on a 248 year cycle. So every 248 years, there's some revelation of occult knowledge. But the fact that it was also when the global cycle because of the procession also entered that at the same time is like, this is the most unprecedented revelation of occult knowledge ever in revelation of truth. Pluto holds the keynote of truth as a planet. So if we think about, I mean, this is the lifting of the veil right here. The, the amount of truth, you can get the truth about anything. I mean, this goes from the level of the most profound revelation of truth, like in human design, all the way to just mundane stuff like a Yelp review. I mean, we, we're getting the truth about everything right now. It's at your fingertips. You can Google it and get the truth, which is not to say there isn't also a lot of, you know, fake news out there. But at the same time, um, 
you know, it, it was, it's amazing to see how the 60s were just this massive pulling back of the veil. And every, we can just see all down the line of what's been hidden in the shadows coming to light. Me Too movement, the tremendous abuse of power that has gone on for so long. Edward Snowden and, you know, um, you know, all these like whistleblowers. I mean, it's incredible um, to me, being alive during this time has been one of the most incredible things and it, it makes me really sad in some way. I mean, I'm happy to, to be alive during this time, but sad that it's going away, you know? And uh, there's a whole lecture series that Ra does on mysticism, which is one of the only times in the human design material that I actually felt really sad about what I'd been hearing because I can come to peace with a new world of people being busy and selfish and whatever. But the thing that I had a hard time with was the realization that we are in the era of the revelation of mysticism, that people in the future just won't care. They just won't care. The end of mysticism is what Ra calls that series. And, you know, it's that basically, I mean, we are lucky that we will all carry this frequency with us. It's not like 2027 rolls around and we suddenly lose interest in mysticism. We'll always be interested. It's really the people who are born after 2027 they grow up, they become adults, they have no interest in this. They don't have interest in the occult knowledge. They don't have interest in what's really going on underneath the surface. They have different interests. And we'll see what, what they are here to you know, witness. They're here to witness 54, ambition and radical transformation and rising up to change material circumstances. It's, it's a different world. You know, they're gonna be living in a totally different world. They aren't here to witness the lifting of the veil. That's really what we all get to share together. And that's about as close as I get to being emotional. You know, I have undefined solar plexus, I'm wired cold, but I, I tear up when I see that we all get to live through this lifting of the veil of occult knowledge. So, and then on the opposite end, we have the leader, we have leadership, and how do you lead during this time? What, what has allowed people to lead? You know, what has led us has been um, 62, which is the other detail gate. We've had nine and 62. We've had these two details gates. And um, it's all about, you know, it's leadership through details. And we expect our leaders to have the details and have them right. And I think we've already seen, at least in the US, the breakdown of this and how, you know, our current president is really a, uh, is part of this breakdown that we've lost good leadership in this time because it's all crumbled because it's all crumbling it's all ending you know now there are no details now it's fake news and now it's wide swaths and glossing over everything and so we, we're getting to really witness the end of of all of this it's not like fdr who probably knew all the details of for the new deal had to know all the details about all of the things in order to be a leader you know the sort of um, you know, leaders we've looked up to over the course of this have been the ones that have ha had, had those details. And then bringing to the last gate here, and then I'll just open it up to discussion uh, about the cost of planning before we move on to post 2027. But the last gate here is the example. And um, it's basically um, kind of at a, at a mundane level, what we've been told we should try to live up to. I mean, there's a more mystical aspect of the example, obviously, because it's gate one, it's an individual gate, and so it can be about, you know, the, you know, creative and so on. But at a mundane level, at a mass kind of homogenized level, it's simply, this is what you should strive for. This is your example to emulate. Um, and that example is gate 32, which is the fear of failure and trying to be successful. And the example you should live up to is be successful. You know, it's a tribal example. It's a monetary example that leads into this channel of capitalism. That's all about your example is, you know, be successful and this tremendous. So the other interesting thing is every era is going to have one fear gate. And this blew my mind when I realized it because the fear gates of the spleen, I'm talking about splenic fear gates here, not the fears of the solar plexus or the ajna, which are more properly called uh, nervousness or anxieties. But the fears of the spleen, for those who haven't, um, oh, I just, yeah, I just realized I can, I can be using, I can be using this graphic as an example to talk about, talking about. So you'll notice that um, 
after gate 46 in the wheel, you see gate 18, 48, 57, 32, 50, 28, 44. Those are all spleen. Those are all splenic gates. Okay. Gate 46 marks, you know, the, the that's not splenic, that's G-center, but then all of the, the, the following gates until you get to gate one are splenic. And so they're all fear gates. So what was so profound to me was the realization that at each era, for every, every epoch has one fear activated simply because of the way that these two gates, sorry, these two um, incarnation crosses are, the distances you know, between them, they're based on the midpoints and so on. There's going to be one fear gate for every age. And the fear since 1615 has been the fear of failure. That's the one fear. The other fear, the other splenic gates haven't been activated during this time. It's just the fear of failure. That has been the big fear, part of the channel of capitalism. No wonder, you know, that, you know. So it's been this incredible fear of not getting ahead and this incredible drive to be the, the top, to work your way up the, you know, company or to be an entrepreneur. It's been a little different through each um, line as it's moved from line six down to line one. But there's always been this incredible push since 1615 to be successful. Well, that is changing. And so the fear gate that we're entering into um, is the fear of the unknown. It's going to be gate 57. And we already feel it. You know, the fear of the unknown. Look at what's going on now with this pandemic. This is already, you know, we have one foot into the next cycle. Even though it's seven years to come, I mean, we're, we're feeling it, this fear of the unknown. People aren't going to care in the future if they've become the most famous or the most rich. They're going to care if they survive. They're going to be afraid of things they don't know. And it's going to be a completely different thing. You know, what's driven us so far for the last 400 years has just been trying to get on top, to succeed, to be the, the top, to, you know, to, um, to be the best of the you know, company or to have the best you know, the best skills, the most skilled and so on, to be successful in your skills and successful in your details. And all of this is going away. No one's gonna care about success. No one's gonna be afraid of failure. They're not gonna care if you're the CEO of a company. It's all the same in the cross of the sleeping Phoenix. It's about, can you survive, you know? <laughs> and are you really being yourself? And are you just doing your own thing? I mean, there's a positive side of it too, which is that we're going into such an individual time. And something I always tell individuals, when I see somebody in a reading who has individual circuitry, I always tell them, um, don't compare yourself to others. Individual is not about comparison. It's not about best or worst. There's no such thing as best or worst. These are tribal and collective concepts. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're actually you know, collective at their, at their base. When we get to what's the best in the world or the, the most successful or the, you know, these, these are meaningless terms for individual circuitry. Because for the individual, it's all about what is correct for you as a unique person. Nothing to do with putting yourself in comparison to others. I mean, that is poison for an individual to say, wow, that person's better than me in this way. Or no, better and worse are not individual concepts. So I think that's what I, what I have. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really... Oh, I have a few other notes just about the cost of planning, and then we can open up to discussion if anyone has any ideas. But um, yeah, so, so, so I also had a note that we've been in a first line theme and looking at how there's been a real breakdown of social structures, not just for social, social understanding, not just because of the end of the cost of cost of planning, but because we've been in the first line. The first line is not here to have a social you know, awareness. The first line is not here to be, to, to be you know, socially equipped. So there's a lot of people who talk about going back to family values and going back to an earlier time where there was more you know, social fabric. I mean, even just the fact we've been in the first line since 1961, we've all been kind of trying to figure out our own thing and not really, there hasn't been a lot of social understanding. It's like, there's all this oversensitivity of different tribal groups demanding respect from each other, but at the same time, we're in a first line theme. The programming is not saying, learn about your neighbor, learn what their life is like. The programming is saying, you know, are you successful? <laughs> it's really been a self-absorbed time. The programming is saying, how are your skills? Are you focused? Are you, you know? <laughs> and, and so it's been interesting that 
even though we're simultaneously moving into a more individual and a more selfish time, we're also moving into a sixth line time, which is going to require more of a broad view, understanding, and a sort of a detached acceptance of the other. And that's maybe a positive because that's the only way we're gonna survive collectively and, and you know, individually is by sort of taking that sixth line stance in the future of, okay, that's your thing, it's not my thing, no big deal. You know, it's like the sixth line is all about tolerance and all about understanding in an objective, detached way. And that's, you know, um, yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be very different. We've been in this sort of first line time. So I think that's all the notes that I have for the process of planning. I know this is a lot of information. Um, you know, luckily for all of us, I don't have as copious of notes for the Cross of the Sleeping Phoenix. <laughs> so I because also that's such a history. You know, we don't really know where it's going. Um, but but yeah, the, so those are my notes for the cross of planning. Does anybody have any general observations or ideas? Or I'd like to open up the floor um, for anybody who'd like to chime in. Looking uh, in the chat. I'm just gonna drink my coffee for a minute. Just kind of yes. Well, I just have to say, this is Barbara. I have no tribal in my uh, chart. So um, I'm pretty, you know, I'm collective and individual and I do find, and I have the loner channel. So <laughs> I do like my space alone and uh, as Esther and John know. <laughs> as, um, and so this, you know, being around, as I was saying earlier, my daughter-in-law has the planning, uh, cross of planning and she's all left arrows. And we are, we're so very different. In some ways, we're very much alike, but I just don't have any of that. I, I really have to make the effort to be supportive uh, for certain things, unless it's really important to me. Uh, so I can see where uh, this, this shift will be to go to the other side of that, I guess, with the right uh, variation. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, I could see that moving pretty, but, that's interesting about the going from one right to the sixth line. Yeah, yeah, it, no, it is. And it also, um, at a kind of mystical poetic level, it's an interesting time that we're in the time of the alpha and the omega because we're in the first mm -hmm. line, but it's the end of the process. Yes. And uh, the way that the crosses are set up is that when you get to the end of a process is really about having the strong foundation to prepare you for the sixth line of the next process, which is transition. So we're, we're actually preparing, it's, instead of the fifth line getting you ready for the transition, mm -hmm. it's the first line getting you ready for the transition. So that's right. actually a really, a really interesting point that mm -hmm. um, the, another reason there's such a sense of urgency is because this is about preparing the solid foundation to survive the transition, which is why Ra talks so much about strategy and authority and how the occult knowledge that we are now receiving is so we all have a solid foundation in the mechanics of the Maya so that we can have a smooth transition into the sixth line process because it's going to be such a transitional time with so much chaos and so much uncertainty and also so much detachment and people just not caring. I mean, the sixth line has a real detached quality to it and a real indifference to others. Yeah. And so right now we get to really care about having that solid foundation because for a long time, I mean, for probably the rest of our lives, we're not gonna, we're not gonna live in a world where where there that there's that same caring about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's right. getting a solid foundation ready for the transition. And I do having a profile of six two. I so get that now. Looking back, it's been about three years that I've been involved with the uh, human design, and it made so much sense to me my nature and my husband would call me, he'd say, you know, you're aloof. And I was like, you know, okay, so I'm aloof. now I know why, because I'm on the roof. You know, I didn't know what that was all about, but I really can see myself always in that more of the objective, neutral kind of uh, way that I deal with things. Yeah, and, I mean, that's how the six million can be so so trustworthy is that um, it's it's, yeah, I mean, it's, and so it's interesting that, yeah, that we are going into a six line time. I mean, you know, in some way we're going into your time. <laughs> you, know, yeah. the, the, you know, 
I'm I, I it's going to get to be, you know, 2027 and I'll, I'll wake up and be like, what the heck world is this? This is not the world I know. And you're going to be like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I love this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's something that, Ra, that Ross said about himself and his own life. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and share this next graphic here. What Rod said was that, uh, you know, he has, I don't know how many, eight or nine or 10 first lines, and he was born in a second line cycle. And he mm. felt completely outside of the world until he was, you know, 12 years old when everything entered into the first line. And then he finally actually felt like, wow, I can actually do work in this world. My investigation can be of use to people. And, you know, I also have nine or 10 first lines or something. No, I, no actually I have nine third lines. I think I have seven or eight first lines. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I don't really have, I have like two second lines. Uh, you know, I, I'm mostly a first line person and I have almost no six lines. I think I have two six lines. I'll have to check. But, you know, we're entering into a world where all of my hard work, taking all these notes and doing all this detail <laughs> is not necessarily going to be that interesting to people in the future. So I'm glad to have you all here today. Mm -hmm. So I can share <laughs> this so you can all have a solid foundation moving into the future because people mm. are not going to care. Yeah, yeah, be prepared. Okay. I think I have eight two second lines. I'm not <laughs> sure. It's been a while since I counted them. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, then people are probably always calling you, calling you out to things. Yes. Okay, yeah. so I noticed there was actually a chat uh, from C, that C had a question uh, in the chat, which is, what are the stars that the arrows are pointing at. Mm. Um, and that was for the previous graphic, but it's the same as this one, except that the inside gates have been switched out now because right. this is now the graphic for the sleeping Phoenix, Phoenix and the cross of penetration, exactly. Now, I don't know, um, see what, what you mean by the stars. Is it really, do you just mean this kind of eight pointed star or, or the stars in the like, background? There's, there's, yeah, in the background, there's like, don't, doesn't it seem that the, that each, gate is pointing to one of these eight stars like the one at the 20 is really close to it and 34 is really close to it oh Does, do you not understand what i'm talking about it's yeah. like the, the actual graphic green stars so like, like the cosmos like the night sky you mean yeah well i don't i think that that is just color graphic i mean i think that's added for color it's not I, an I actual don't... representation of the sky no, but it's but it's great that you brought that up because I will say that um, oh, yeah. it's yeah it's it is great that you brought that up though because there is a very under researched aspect of human design which does look at the stars and Rod covered it in his Rave Cosmology series which was his gray courses and he does talk about you know, Alcyone or however you say it. And, uh, and he talks about Sirius and he talks about the different stars, um, you know, Aldebaran and they have really cool names and cool, you know, mythology behind them. And they are relevant in so far as the, the movement of the so-called fixed stars is how we arrive at this, at these global cycles. And so it is relevant, but this graphic doesn't show it. But you, you would be able to research, for instance, as the fixed stars move or apparently move according to the precession of the equinoxes or the axial precession is the more technical term. So as the so-called fixed stars apparently move due to axial precession, um, the gates do take on different qualities. And that is kind of what we're looking at at a high level here. But there is a way to look at it more kind of nitty gritty, which is which is really fascinating. It's all in um, Ra's Rave Cosmology series um, on the stars. Okay, so, okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're looking at the cross of the Sleeping Phoenix and the cross of Penetration. And, um, and these are the, the eight gates that are inside now, you know, 34, 20, 59, 55, Sleeping Phoenix, and the others are the cross of uh, penetration. And so I started with gate 25 again. So we know that the way is moving from the family to the spirit, gate of the spirit. Gate 55 is actually the most emotional of all of the solar plexus gates. It has the highest highs and the lowest lows. Um, it's a really profound gate. It's, the, it's a really mystical love gate. 
and mysterious and so on. And it, it has a lot of qualities, a lot of connotations. I mean, it can be about spiritedness in the sense of enthusiasm. You know, if you look at the etymology of the word enthusiasm, it comes from en theos, the God within or the spirit, the spirit within. Um, the way that I've understood this, and this is just one of the kind of ways we can look at it, is that in the future, the way is really about, it's pointing to the mutation of the solar plexus from a motor to an awareness center. Right now it's doing double duty and we have the awareness, but because it's a motor, I mean, this you know, mutation hasn't occurred yet. And that it's really about this burgeoning stopping of the wave and the burgeoning emotional awareness, which according to Ra, will emerge first in females because Ra claims that all mutations emerge in female human beings first, and that it'll be female babies that are born when Saturn is in the sixth line of gate 55. So that's wow. what Ra has said, is, is after 2027, the first time Saturn, which, you know, Saturn's on a 27, 28 year cycle, something. the first time Saturn gets to the sixth line of gate 55, you're going to have a wave of baby girls born with this, with this you know, mutation. And this is pure c conjecture, but um, it's based on his deconstruction of the sort of cosmic fairy tales about the you know, coming rave and the uh, uh, mutations that are, that are taking place in the solar plexus. So really um, what it's saying is that the, the way of the future is not gonna be of the family, it's gonna be an individual way of emotional awareness that that is you know emerging now there are other ways we can deconstruct this and we can say how it's also just showing how in the past you know our spirit was in the family and the love of the family and there's going to now be a love of a sort of spirit itself I mean, it's kind of beautiful 25 and 55 getting linked i mean these gates are already linked in their keynotes gate 25 already has such a connection to the spirit and gate 55 is the gate of the spirit. So it is kind of beautiful in some sense, it's that we've put our spirituality into the family and now we can return it to its rightful place, which is in the individual spirit, that the way forward will be individual. It will be, it will be personal and it will be about your own individual spirit. And it, as I said, I have shorter notes for these. You know, I only have one page of, of short notes for this one. So, um, so I don't really have a, a lot for them, but I, I'm, you know, I'm definitely open to, to other readings of it. I mean, um, yeah, my, my basic understanding was just that this is really pointing, you know, to prepare for this transition, we all need um, strategy and authority because that is about really living as yourself and, and living, living correctly your own individual process and that's to prepare us for this time when the only way we'll be able to survive is by being ourselves so strategy and authority will actually keep us alive right now it's a fun experiment and you get to have satisfaction or success or surprise or peace but in the future you actually just get to survive you know because because you're you're you know no longer living according to somebody else's authority and it really is an is, you know the positive side of the future is that it will be a time when we're, we're truly able to, to live you know, without authorities because the authorities will simply go away. There's not going to be the authorities at the same level. It's not gonna be that you know, to, to learn in the future, you won't have a standardized you know, a curriculum. You're going to have um, teachers and small groups and, and you're gonna have information that's passed around, but it's not gonna be standardized in, in such a way. Jonah, I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, I was just wondering about, you know, the Penta and how that will affect folks, you know, moving forward mm -hmm. past 2027, because right now, you know, when it, it because the Penta is transoric, right? So like it affects, you know, when we have a group of people together, somehow that's, you know, has a force of and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Will that continue to be something that exists in 2027? Will Penta still have the same effect on the collective, you know, like people together? Well, yeah, it's, it's actually, it's the opposite. I mean, you would think that because the collective and tribal are kind of being backgrounded, that maybe the Penta would lose its clutch on people. 
but and also because of all of this push towards individuality and so on um, you would think that the pinta would then lose its grip but it's actually much scarier than that um, <laughs> because what we're being prepared for is the the beginning of the conscious pinta and yeah. So far, pentas have been variable and they've been unconscious and they've just been kind of things that happen automatically and are very fluid and flexible and one person enters and another you know, leaves and so on. But actually the coming form, the rave, um, is designed for the penta, really designed to be a cell in the penta. Mm. And so it's actually, um, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's a great question because you would think from looking at how all this stuff is breaking down, then aren't, isn't the Penta going to break down? Isn't the Ra going to break down? Um, but actually, I think a lot of what it's preparing for is, and it, it'll be interesting to see, like, w w where can we see that? I mean, wow. you know, w where are we able to see that in the gates? Like, is it because, you know, if, if, if I mean, I guess, I guess one, one place will be, um, when we're looking at, I, I, these are all G-center gates. So as we're looking at them, I guess we'll have to look at what are we going to identify with in the future? And yeah, it's, it's weird. I, I guess the, the only way I can explain it is that the Penta is not necessarily tribal or collective. That the Penta to itself is individual because it considers itself an individual. The, the Penta right. does. And it right. considers the people in it the same way I consider my left hand and right hand and my feet, you know, they're like, they're organs of it. And so, you know, there's a really kind of a scary side of it where, where Ra really put on his sci-fi horror future where he said, you know, um, it's, it's really, you know, we're, we're moving towards conscious Penta where the Penta will, will take on the value that the individual has now. And as he put it, he said, I don't want to live in that world. Now, this is not just post 2027. This is going, you know, hundreds of years in the future because it's going to take a long time for that to emerge. And what Rod said was actually that the conscious Pinta will not emerge in Homo sapiens and transitus, us. It, it will emerge in the rave, which is a new form that will be given birth to sometime in the coming centuries, sometime mm -hmm. after 2027. Um, which will be what we consider to be autistic and unable to take care of itself and nonverbal and all of this stuff, but that they will be able to telepathically communicate with each other in a penta and basically be part of a hive mind. And, you know, Ra was saying, like, leave me out of it. I'm so glad, you know, he would always joke that uh, he had yang yang crystals and that they were being destroyed. This was his last incarnation, saying, and good thing too, because I don't, I don't want to live in that world. You know, I don't want to be a, an organ of some other being. So yeah, I, I would imagine for us right now, because the rave is not here yet, Penta will just continue to operate as it does. But at some point in the future, um, and I'm happy to, sh to share, I have, you know, more information on raves. I kind of left out the whole topic of the rave because it's the most sci-fi. It is fascinating. It's just hard to really know how that, you know, how or what, or it's not really relevant to our lives. It is fascinating though. And this whole idea that, I mean, there's a bunch of sci-fi stuff. For instance, um, here's one of the others that's really fascinating to me. Because of the mutation in the 1949, which has to do with domesticating animals, after 2027, animals that are born after that time, theoretically are going to be resistant to domestication. So I love this kind of sci-fi idea of you know the herds of cows stampeding out of the meat packing plant because they were <laughs> you know, domesticated. And, you know, so there, there's a whole sci-fi aspect of it that's that's a lot of fun to uh, you know think about. And I, I definitely can share some of those you know materials and some of those lectures with those who are interested in following up more specifically on the rave and the coming of the conscious penta. Mm. Uh, because I'm kind of focusing more just on, you know, what, what, you know, what does it mean for us? And I, I, my guess would be that the Pinto will still operate the same way and mm. that it's still kind of, you know, that, that for us, we are not going to necessarily feel any reduction or, or increase in the Pentec control. I, I will say we had a great um, talk, one of the last in-person Human Design Catalyst meetings we had, uh, which I would be happy to revisit well, I guess it might be online, but I'd be happy to revisit this too. It was on Penta and Ra. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a really fascinating movie. Yeah, we, yeah, we watched, yeah, we watched those. those. Okay, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. I, I love, I love uh, yeah. you know, to look at that. And also just to realize how limited the Pinta is with its three channels, how the Pinta has a throat, but no Ajna. You know, yeah. I always I always laugh at that. It's like it, no it, mind. It, yeah, no no mind. It'll talk. It's not <laughs> think about it. I I loved you used the word terrifying in, during those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that was also one of my scary ones. You know, I, I yeah. do the box every once in a while. And then for, for Halloween last year, we did um, we did encounter. Death. And that was also yeah, the encounter. Yeah. yeah, that was fun too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, th I think even if this stuff isn't that practical, the kind of gray area of human design, it adds a lot of color. And mm. I really like the archetypal, you know, vocabulary it gives us and just, you know, I, I, I enjoy it so much. And it's probably also because I'm across the planning person. I mean, we all are. We're born into it. So we love the yeah. details. And we, love, mm -hmm. we love getting to that nitty gritty and seeing how it plays out. And, you know, but the future will be, yeah, the love of the spirit. And then, yeah. um, and the love of, yeah, we're going to be moving on. So, so yeah, it's interesting to see, see the love gates. I mean, it's kind of scary also. Mm -hmm. Gate 10 is a love gate. Well, in the yeah. future, it's going to be in 34, the love of power, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, but there's positive ones too. I mean, there's positive sides to this. So let's do, since we just did 25, let's do 46. because They're kind of a pair. And so for, okay, so where are we here? 46. To yeah, to the right. Yeah, the temple. Um, so this one was a little bit, it's hard for me to figure out. Um, oh, and also I had, I realized now that I misspoke earlier, by the way, just while we were on gate 55. Earlier I said 59.6 is selfishness. That, that was not correct. It's actually 55.6 is selfishness. Um, so it's just, so just actually one last point on this. Um, because really just reading through the lines tells such a story, such mm -hmm. a story. Even if you don't incorporate, you know, the witness, the way, the nature, all this stuff, just reading line six of gate 55, selfishness. We already see that we're moving towards this being self-absorbed, but then what does it really mean? Well, the detriment where the material abundance exists, but no one gets to share its light. You know, it's... Um, mm -hmm material abundance that no one gets to share. But then the exaltation, the possibility of finding the spirit through materialism, th through it. So it's, or acquisition that, acquisition obsession that although alienating is still indirectly beneficially, indirectly beneficial materially to others. I mean, this is all kind of a, a you know, jumble, but at a, at a high level, the way I understand this to be is that we're actually going to be entering into a time of abundance, but it'll, it'll be, on the one hand, the detriment will be inequality, which we're already seeing, vast you know, inequality. But there's also um, going to be a lot of abundance. And it's weird to think of this future as abundant because you hear people in human design communities, like I'm part of the 2027 wave you know, um, group where everyone talks about what the future is going to be like. And it always seems like a kind of Mad Max scenario of scarcity. It always seems like when we talk about this post 2027, how scary we're going to be scarce. Well, when we talk about it, I mean, that might be true for a period of time, but it's also going to be a period of vast abundance. And the only way I can understand that is to reconcile it with what Raj said about the lowering fertility of humanity. I mean, um, gate 34 is a gate of asexuality. It's a gate of impotence and a gate of, you know, frigidity. And it's, it's going to be a lowering of sex. People are going to be too busy to have sex, too busy to procreate. We already see this in very futuristic places like, you know, Japan, where it's very hard for them to keep their population up because people are just too busy. That gate 34 is so busy that it can, it can be not interested in sex. It's too busy for sex, you know. Um, of course, we do have gate, gate 59 being implicated too, which, which is also interesting, which I'll get to momentarily. But... Um, but yeah, I guess just realizing that the lowering, the lowered population, I mean, everyone who's afraid of overpopulation, it's not going to happen. We are at peak population. And as we move over to this time, we're actually going to have drastically reduced population, the result being abundance. Although there still may be some, you know, inequality because the detriment is still always there, um, that people won't share, where the material abundance exists, but no one gets to share. And the other part of the detriment is that 
an obsessive materialism with a mean spirit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mean spirited selfishness that doesn't share. So I just wanted to, wanted to kind of has a side note there that's interesting to realize that our imagination of the future is always this kind of scarcity future, but actually according to human design, it's a future of abundance. And then the last thing I'll say about this before moving on is just how does that tie into the spirit? How does it tie into the spirit? Like how do we reconcile these vastly different keynotes, materialism with spirit? Well, human design is always going to have these coincide. When you look at 54.4, uh, the most mystical line of all of human design, enlightenment, enlightenment, it's in a material mundane process. It's like the mundane is the spiritual. So on the one hand, this is simply human design saying that the spiritual is always embedded within uh, yeah. the mundane. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this is also talking about, you can, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can only really po ponder about these great philosophical spiritual questions when you have all of your material needs met. It was only in ancient Greece that they could come up with Greek philosophy because they had all the slaves and all the, you know, and I mean, I, I hate to put it that way, but there is a certain, there's a luxury to being able to ponder the, the spirit. So on the one hand, human design tells us, no, you actually don't need anything. The spirit is there embedded in the deepest mundane. You don't need wealth. You don't need abundance. You don't need luxury because it's right there all the time in the mundane. And that's true. On the other hand, human design also tells us when you have an abundance of mundane, of, of the mundane, you know, wealth and so on, your life is going to feel empty. You're not going to have, but, but then that emptiness is what, is what you can then fill with spirit. So it's an interesting kind of, it's not saying you need money to be spiritual, but it's saying that in a time of great abundance, there is also the free time to, to really nurture that spirit. Right. So it's kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of both. It's a both hand. So one thing I find interesting, excuse me, about the, I'm looking at 25 to 55, is 25 on the other side of the chat, the channel is 51, which I look at, it, I go, you're being shocked into the love of spirit, but on, the, and on the other side of 55 is 39, which is provoked into yeah. The, the spirit, right? Yeah. Right, so that's a that's different a way of point. looking at it. No, yeah. it's, it's beautiful to think about how, how, yeah, that's a great point. That 51 yeah. and then, you know, 39 are both. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a different kind of energy. One is shocking, but the other is pushing you, like provoking yeah. you more, you know? Yeah, yeah, but they're both, they're both, they're similar in certain ways. And also, mm. um, what's interesting because we have gate 51 is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also I had an interesting, so the, the sun went through gate 51 recently mm -hmm. and a lot of people in human design groups were saying, I wonder what shocks we're going to get. Like, I wonder what surprises. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, 51 can shock you in that way. Um, because, you know, I have gate 25 hanging. And so my whole life, gate 51 people shocked the heck out of me. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's an electromagnetic that makes me very uncomfortable, but uh, both my parents have gate 51. So they're always shocked. Uh -huh. But, um, yeah. But the, other, but the other aspect of it that was interesting was that I didn't see a lot of people talking about is that 51 is also rousing. It's arousing mm -hmm. the spirit. It's there to rouse people, like to give a rousing right. speech. Like for those who watched Game of Thrones, I think about Tyrion Lannister yeah. giving a rousing speech to get everybody to mm -hmm. go into battle or so on, to get their yeah. spirits up and to, you know. Um, so that's another aspect of it. Yeah. And I saw that a lot when the sun just translated, you know, 51. There was a lot of rousing people towards action. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay. yeah, so let's do uh, gate 46 now. So this one, yeah, this one is a little bit, I, I have not been able to really unlock it too much. I feel like, um, I, I feel like these are all puzzles, you know, and, and you have these breakthroughs, but they're all, they're very cryptic and it's hard to, to unlock. But I heard Ra talk a little bit about it. And what Ra talked about was primarily, so what he talked about was that there's not going to be any easy intimacy that the free love of the 60s, which has culminated in the hookup culture of Tinder and all of this sort of easy come, easy go intimacy, is not gonna be there in the future. And what Ross said, which was very sci-fi, was that we're gonna have such population problems that he could almost imagine a future that has organized intimacy, like some sort of Orwellian thing where you sign up and you, instead of getting jury duty, it's like, oh, well, I got to do my job to, to propagate the species, you know. <laughs> so I thought that that was kind of a, a really funny idea. They would have, you know, 
rooms that you have to go to to experience intimacy. If you're doing your duty instead of jury duty, you get, you know, schedule. <laughs> but, um, but I don't know necessarily how that's the temple. And Ra didn't really give too many clues in this regard. You know, it could be that intimacy becomes so rare that we do sort of have a reverence for it when it does happen in the future. I mean, I'm, I'm not really... I'm not really sure, you know, it's an interesting one. Uh, but my note here was no more easy intimacy. Mm-hmm. And um, and also, so generally what I think of as gate of dispersion, what is it really dispersing? It's dis- dispersing the conflict on the other side and it's dispersing mm-hmm. the conflict that is the barrier to further intimacy. So 59 is um, like people who have that, you know, channel, you know, 59.6, that's the aura cutter channel. Uh, you, yeah. you have that one, Kevin. You're, you're, you you have that channel, and uh, what I've noticed uh, is that they they're really good at you know someone kind of comes at them in an aggressive way, and they're good at dispersing all of that mm-hmm. conflict. Someone comes at them and says, "Hey, I saw you posted that anti-Trump thing on your Facebook page, and who are you thinking you?" And then I, I've seen you do this, Kevin. You said, "Hey, are you still painting those plates? You know, how are those plates coming along?" And then, then it suddenly it's dispersed, or I don't know if it's plates or yeah. something, or, or wooden ducks, or you know, some hobby they have, and you ask about it, and suddenly all the conflict is dispersed. So it could also just be that that will be um, in the future will just be really necessary for people to do because. When you don't have, when you can't rely on the authorities anymore, you have to, you have to know how to, how to disperse that conflict on your own. You have to be good at bargaining with that person because the cops won't be there to, you know, to get them in trouble. So, I, I mean, I, I don't really have a, a great association for why it's the temple, but those were just some of my, some of my ideas. Um, one that at first I thought was was really negative, but now I'm seeing that it has a positive too, because everything has a positive and a negative, was that gate 10. And that yeah. was because it's moving, it's saying the behavior will be 34. Right. And I have 34.3 and it's not, it's not great. You know, 34.3 <laughs> is, you know, a machismo and it's basically displaying power. And it doesn't happen often, but, uh, you know, there have been times in my life where I become a completely different person. And it's not that I necessarily even, you know, I don't, I don't yell or scream or any of that. It's displaying power through a certain presence or a way of being, a real macho way of being. Really, it's like a, through silence, oftentimes, silence and eye contact and things like that. And, you know, this is the behavior we're moving towards. Like, everyone's going to be, like, displaying their power. And, like, this is, like, tough guy, tough girl stuff. You know, this is, this is, uh... so at first I um, kind of thought, wow, that sucks. You know, we're moving towards a, a future world everyone displays their power. But then I heard Ra talk about it, and he said that, you know, 34 is about empowering individuation empowering individuation and power to really be yourself and i thought that's great then i mean if, if people are going to be able to actually be themselves and actually be freaks and geniuses and be as weird as they want and not have the the collective standard breathing down their neck telling them to be a certain way or the tribal people saying you're out of the tribe if you act that way if you date that person if you do this thing i mean so that that's kind of the positive side of it is that there will be this empowered it's, it's empowering. It's individual. Individuals about empowerment. The other note I had was I just read, um, just before we started this, I read line six of gate 34, which I was not familiar with. So there's a lot of lines in human design, 384 of them. It's hard to, to keep them all in your head, you know? And I, I looked at it and it said um, common sense. And, and then I read a little further and it talks about the lack of restrictions and how important it is to have common sense when there are no restrictions. So then I thought, okay, this is interesting. What it's really telling us is that we're entering into a time where there's not gonna be a lot of restrictions. It's not gonna be the government saying you have to stay indoors because there's a pandemic. There'll still be a pandemic, maybe a new one, who knows, but the government is not gonna necessarily, I mean, probably for a while it will, but as it continues to break down, there will come a time where people are going to just need to rely on their own common sense. You know, that will be the expected behavior, just to use common sense. And so it is very individual. I mean, common sense is an individual thing. It's something that you have to develop for yourself. 
Okay, so then um, gate 15 here. What is the pattern you're entering into? So I don't really have a lot of notes here. In fact, maybe I'll look up um, line six of gate 20. Because I'm, I'm curious, you know, we can, we can put this together um, ourselves. I mean, my only note was just that contemplation and, you know, I mean, the now. We think about it as um, gate 20 as the voice of uh, I am now. You know, I am now this, I am now that. So that the pattern is going to be much more um, in the moment in that we're going to have to kind of live moment to moment. It's gonna, it, might, it might be harder to, because the pattern is all about making predictions about the future. And the pattern is all about how do we predict what's going to happen in the future? Well, if it's in gate 20, it's going to be like, wow, because things are changing so rapidly. The pattern is changing so much. It's so much linked to the now that it's very hard to make those forecasts of what things are going to be like in the future, which also ties into that gate, you know, 57 fear of the unknown. Um, or, you know, but it's, it's basically, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So, so reading uh, line six, the line six of gate 20 is wisdom and the blue line, which is not guaranteed, but is the sort of potential there is contemplation, which results in the ability to apply understanding. The detriment is, um, well, okay, I'll read the exaltation first because the detriment references it. The detriment, the exaltation is the establishment for the benefit of society, values, ideals, and their patterns and how they can be understood and applied. Transforming individual awareness for general application and understanding. So it's actually, it actually sounds pretty good. When I think about that, I'm like, wow, like, the the pattern the sort of logical the, the sort of logical predictions of where we're going to go in the future are going to rely on individual wisdom individual people who are able because an individual gate we're going to out of their own contemplation they're going to be able to transform their individual you know awareness in a way that's going to be able to be generally applied so that actually doesn't sound that bad to me um but then the detriment the same as above, but motivated by the self-satisfying mental challenge rather than altruism. So I guess it's really just saying that, you know, so to look at where we were, the pattern has been uh, 16. So it's been in order to get ahead in the future and to, to predict the future and so on, we need a lot of skills. And that's just going to change. Now we're going to need a lot of wisdom. We need a lot of wisdom. I mean, if we take these two, this one and the last one, you know, together, it's saying we need common sense and wisdom in this upcoming age. Like this is how people will survive. This is how life will continue is through being wise. It's going to need that. Okay, we're in the final quarter of it, and these are pretty short notes. So please interrupt. Uh, I'm going to go kind of quickly through these because this has been quite a long one, and I appreciate everybody for staying with me. Um, so now we are in the gates of the Sphinx. And uh, I'll start with gate 13, note as well. Um, so yeah, so this is the witness. And you know, what are we going to, to really witness? Um, well, we're gonna witness a lot of change. Gate 54 is uh, about you know, material transformation, that whole channel. For people who have that, that whole channel, I oftentimes will tell them if they have the you know, 54, 32, I'll say, wow, you really help people change their material circumstances, get a makeover, get a new haircut and all this stuff. Well, people are here to, in the future, will be witnessing dramatic material changes. Um, and they'll also be witnessing ambition or drive to rise up. And it's different than how we've had the fear of failure and the cost of planning. This is really different because it's not really the fear of failure anymore which is of course in the other end of this, this gate, the other end of this, this channel. Um, it's really just witnessing the ambition to rise up in, in this time, you know, and, and it's, gonna, it's gonna be a lot of material change that people are gonna be, be witnessing. Um, you know, 13 is really experiential. I think of, uh, I wrote some notes on, on 13. It's um, very human. It's the, you know, fellowship of man, the fellowship of humankind. And, and listening to others. And it's also, gate 13 is also what takes notes and what records history. And so it's interesting to see how, you know, gate 13, it's basically been, I, I like doing these kinds of, so it's been in 61, right? 
And so it's really been that the way that we've understood our history now is through that occult knowledge. Like even as I'm teaching this right now in the cross of planning, the key to unlock human history is through occult knowledge. Well, in the future, the key to unlock it will be through ambition. And that's just an interesting change, an interesting shift. But um, yeah, I love when you can put together a keynote like that. It just like fits so perfectly. Like we've literally been understanding our own history and how we ended up here by way of occult knowledge. And in the future, people will understand that through ambition. Now, I don't know if that means you'll have to be ambitious to get to that history or if it will be seeing history through the lens of ambition, you know, that, that people made history what it is. The other thing I'll say is that if there's one time that I would like to be alive besides now with the 61-1, it's when the global cycle enters into the fourth line, which is about 150 years from now. Because the 54-4 is the most mystical line in all of human design. And the whole Ray V. Ching, line four of gate 54, is the most mystical, enlightenment and enlightenment. And I would just love to be alive during that time because I predict it would be a, I expect it would be a time of the flourishing of the spirit of you know, humanity. This, this, this kind of you know, renaissance of mysticism during that time. Even though as a whole, we've lost access to mysticism and to occult knowledge. It would be like a renaissance during, during the uh, dark ages. Um, we're coming to the end here, just a few more. So now here uh, with the leader, the future leader will be 53. Well, 53 is the other end of that 42 we looked at, which is all about endings. 53 is the other part of the abstract format channel, and it's about beginnings. And so what it's saying is we're, we'll be looking for leaders who will be able to begin things, who will be able to start things, who will start a new world, basically, because this one is ending. And that leadership will involve starting the, the new. I mean, it's, it's so cool to just see how the cycle that we've been in, the plan is to end everything. And then in the beginning that, and then in the, the next one, you know, it'll be leaders uh, who are able to begin. And it's also the beginning of an emotional consciousness, as we talked about with Gate 55, the beginning of emotional awareness. And even though it's not in the solar plexus, it is an experiential abstract gate, which carries with it the connotation of, of being emotional in nature. One will be the example. So what example are we going to try to, to you know, live up to? That's gate 57. And um, that's the example of clarity in the now, of having that clarity in the moment of what's true or false or correct or not, or, you know, that splenic awareness, that intuitive awareness. We're, we're going to be challenged to live up to the example of being intuitive and being able to intuitively make correct you know, decisions in, in the now. And it's gonna be hard for the solar plexus to find people at least in, in, until the emotional wave stops. But even for them, I think it, it will be, you know, the example will be just to be intuitive, to kind of trust in, in intuition and so on. Um, but of course, this is also where we get the fear of the unknown. And then uh, the last one I have, oh, and also, sorry, I, I had one more note here for 57. 57 can also be, um, it's auditory, it's verbal, we're moving to a very individual place and it's part of integration circuitry, just like that, you know, 34 and 20. Um, so it's about survival. So part of it is going to be verbal communication in order to survive. We're gonna have to just like we're going to have to be able to break through people's defenses in order to get them on our side and so on, we're also going to need a lot of verbal communication. We're going to really need to be able to talk things through with people because we're not going to be able to kind of, you know, rely on suing them or something. <laughs> we're not going to be able to call the cops on them. We're going to have to have a lot of verbal communication in the now to survive. And this brings us to the last one, which is the plan. So what's the plan for the future? Well, it's going to be shocking, that's for sure, right? And it's going to be rousing, the plan to rouse the spirit. But, you know, I looked at the sixth line of gate 51. And uh, the sixth line of gate 51 is about adapting to disorder. So to start with, we're going to have to adapt to a lot of chaos. There's going to be a lot of chaos there. 
And, um, you know, besides that, I think it's just going to be, it's, you know, it's saying the plan is to be individual. The plan is to jump into the unknown. Gate 51 is jumping in the un, into the unknown. There is going to be some suffering because 5125 does carry the connotation of suffering. What, I mean, obviously people can suffer in any gate and for any number of reasons, but it's a kind of like a rite of passage to suffer through the 5125. That is a sort of, you know, initiation through mm -hmm. suffering. Oftentimes, rites of initiation involve, you know, hanging someone by hooks or something in a certain tribal culture. Or, you know, you have to jump into the unknown, you still have to land. And when you land, that can be painful, you know. <laughs> How do you get there? And what happens when you land? And do you break any bones and all of this? So the way everything's going, sort of uniform direction, is into the unknown and into the void and into the sort of and it's going to be about rousing the courage to jump into the void you know together and and as ourselves and on our own individually all right thank you for listening to my presentation <laughs> I'd like to open well, thank it up. you uh, thank you thank you i'd like to open it up to any discussion or ideas thoughts um i'm going to check the uh the chat here stop sharing that Oh, so Mike said, why are the head gates in lighter color than the others? Um, I, don't, I don't think the head gates, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't understand that question. Um, I, I don't see a different color. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't know. Not sure. But um, yeah, any other questions? Oh, 61, 63, 64. Are they... In this graphic, in the graphics we've just been looking at, like in the S, here I can share it again. Um, I can go back to. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. I mean, I think if, if they are, that's an error. I didn't catch that, um, but I don't. I don't think that there's a special significance to those. Um, here I can share that one again. You mean uh, this here, the sixty-one? It doesn't, I don't see it in a different color. So yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just slightly uh, colorblind. It looks like it's the same, the same uh, <laughs> brightness to me. It might be the lighting behind it with the sky. Well, and you know, also, um, Mike, uh, Mike has the 6124. <laughs> oh, the gates around the wheel. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, that 6124, you know, you're going to be pondering a lot of mysteries. Oh, I see what I see what Mike means now. He means in the actual wheel itself. It's just because it is a black and white oh, on the outer circle. Yeah, I, I can explain that. I still don't care, but I do know. So um, <laughs> I, I guess I care enough. So what that is is because this is a black and white image that's been taken from a full color body graph, and as uh, you know, the body graph is color coded, mm -hmm. and so these are uh, the black and white representation of the color of the head center. Right. I'll stop sharing. Uh, well, thank you all. Isn't this a fun, exciting uh, topic? I mean, I've been looking forward to this one more than any. Like, I wanted to do it last week. We ended up doing manifestors, but I just was kind of waiting because, as a five-one, I, I find if I if I do things too early, it doesn't go well, and I need to wait until I have a solid enough foundation that I can actually deliver something interesting to people, or else. It just, it just doesn't work. So, you know, I've been studying this for about two months now, but to actually be able to do it um, is really satisfying to me because I've wanted to do this for a long time. So. Yeah. There's a lot of work involved in it to put all that together. I mean, did you, where did you have that, uh, the actual uh, diagram that you put up? Where'd you get so that from? These I just collected. That one is from a guy named John Knave, uh, who for anybody on Facebook, definitely check out his, his Facebook page, John Nave, N-A-V-E, because um, he's a human design practitioner and he has an incredible collection of human design materials that he's happy to share with you. And, um, you know, I'm a pure collective being, so I'm all about sharing. So that's, <laughs> that's great. That's great. So I love getting these graphics. And I, I think they're just from various materials that Rob came up with over the years. They're probably screenshotted out of some of the PDFs, or maybe they're from PowerPoint presentations that he gave. Mm -hmm. I can share these too. If you just email me or find me on Facebook, I'm happy. I have a folder just called Global Cycles, and I can share these graphics. So Yes, interesting. 
Well, thank you. Oh, this has been a real pleasure. No, this was this was yeah. a long one. I, I knew it would be a lot to get through, but I'm really glad that people stuck around and yeah. stuck through it. It was, you know, I usually try to keep the talks to 20 minutes and they go to 40. This one, I didn't even put a time limit. I was like, I know this is going to go. I know it's going to go over an hour. I know it's going to go for a while, you know. It's actually two hours, Jonah, it's actually two hours and 15 minutes. Well, thank you As all. Projector, I'm like exhausted. Well, I just the projector. You, know, it's, 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 you can always, you know, you can always turn it off if it's ever too much. It's not like, uh, uh -huh. I do appreciate it. I appreciate it you all walking through. Yeah, no, we just, I mean, we just covered um, how many gates? We just covered 24 gates. We covered yeah. 24. That's like a third of the, it's like a third of them yeah. that we just talked about. So. Yeah. No, it was. Uh, good. Um, I thought about breaking it up, but it's kind of nice to do it all in one because we get to see you know, kind of like a before yeah. and after, you know, where, where, where things have been in mm -hmm. our life and where they're yeah. going. I like Otherwise you have to start over again or remember yeah. it for the next time, which is nice to just continue. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. Well, thank and, you very much. And, I and appreciate you've been, it. You've been so helpful, Barbara, as well. I really appreciate this. And uh, so. I, well, the 952s, you know, we can't help ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Well, I have undefined ego, so I've, I've been working on uh, not profusely thanking everybody because I feel like that's a real undefined ego thing to do. But instead, but I do have 25, so I say what I have. So I say, like, I have been wanting to do this for a long time, and I felt mm -hmm. very satisfied when I finally do it. So uh, yes, it makes me happy to do it. And, and now I'm going to have a nice, mellow evening where I'll actually, you know, there's something about, I'm sure other, you know, generators can understand that feeling of, like, when you're in a project, you haven't quite got there and it just builds up. And I'm not a manifesting generator, I'm a generator. So I, I really am not here to multitask. And so in a way, when I have an unclosed loop or something I've been working on like this, it just feels so good just to close the loop to actually do it. So, mm. yeah. Should be done, that is good. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be happy to look at it again. Just, uh, it did, it made a lot of sense um, and, uh, understanding it from a different point of view uh your original one that came up with the you know uh the locks and the where it is so oh, thank yeah, you so, yeah and i'm happy to share all of these i can put that on the screen again that'd be good. real quick for people just so they see which one you're referring to oh wait, yeah is that? yeah yeah that one so, yeah exactly yeah, yeah I that's, like that. that's something that you know i didn't really understand until pretty recently because again i um I had read some stuff about global cycles, but I didn't really get to, to the whole nitty gritty. And the fun part is that now you can kind of look at, you can use the lock and key language to mm -hmm. talk about, wow, how do we actually, like I was saying with uh, gate 13, that's about yeah. our shared history. Well, how mm -hmm. are we unlocking our understanding of that history through a core right. language, through mm -hmm. inner truth, you know? And it's yeah. so cool to be able to kind of put that, I love stringing keynotes. If there's one aspect of, you know, human design that I feel like is really the art, the art of human design is using the keynotes in this way. So Yeah, no, that's great. Right. Very well, good. Will you guys well, enjoy your evening? I can't, yeah, I can't initiate ending this, so. Uh, yes, if, I know. If C would <laughs> yes, like you to can. initiate. I right, you can just respond. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where's that manifester, C? Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jonah. Oh, uh, thank you all. Yeah. See you, Barbara. Bye. Yeah, bye. I'll talk to you. We'll talk tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good night, everyone. On Thursday, John, we'll have our. Uh, yes, for sure. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I've been looking at the yeah. chart a lot and getting getting familiar with it. So, all right. All okay. right. Take care, everybody. Okay. All right. You too. All right.